exposure means reaching the number to micro scale. And the idea is that uh, despite this is a complex maybe on the dependence groups in a community of people that do many mechanics, the, the focus of complex problems, multiphysics and, and, and strongly coupled problems, create space for people who work rather at the sub-RV level, so within your representative elementary volume, and try to connect chemical aspects with the physical processes, microstructural development, and the, the, the rise of mechanical properties at the finer scales. So this means it also gathers people that come from different communities, not just mechanical engineering or civil engineering, but also people working in physics, physical chemistry, chemistry, and, and Tries, but the, so most of the people who have already worked in connection with engineers and just tried to, to transfer know-how and collaborate across these, uh, these scales. And Emanuela, the guy of our speaker today, she is one of the people that has been mostly involved in this kind of endeavor over the recent years. Uh, Emanuela is a professor of physics at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. She graduated and got a PhD from the University of Naples, now with the Medico Secondo. And then she worked as a postdoctor and as an assistant professor at ETH Zurich before moving to the United States, where now she is a full professor and she's also the director of the Institute for Cell Matter Synthesis and Metrology at Georgetown University. Uh, I've known Manuela for quite a few years now, and we haven't seen each other for, for a while. But uh, I have always uh, 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 liked from her talk and I was always impressed by her ability to, to rephrase in a way that is unconventional for engineers some concepts that were all well acquainted with, like the concept of stress, the concept of plastic deformation. She always managed to be a, 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 a viewpoint on this basic concept that was uh, opening up new, new thoughts, and at least in my mind, I believe, the mind of many other people around the globe. So, Enough uh, as an introduction, Manuela, without any further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you, Enrico. Oh, I can hear. Maybe you want to switch your computer audio because I can. I think now it's okay. Uh, thank you for the very kind introduction, uh, and uh, I'm really uh, um, grateful for this invitation and the opportunity to speak to this uh, community. And I'm just sorry not to be able to be there in person. I'm sure it's uh, your, uh, it's, uh, it's it's a fantastic uh, environment. Okay, so let me jump right in. And Enrico, as Enrico was saying in his introduction, I um, I want to talk about. I think I I hope I will be able to provide an example of what we can gain by trying to look uh, at smaller scale what is happening uh, in the material that has uh, important engineering implications to uh, to then uh, use that knowledge and that understanding that we develop to inform actually what we want, what we can do and what we want to do at a larger scale. So my group uh, works a lot uh, trying to build this type of bridges, and we work on this type of uh, uh, themes uh, in the different areas related to the physics of materials uh, with uh, with uh, several applications uh, in, uh, in different uh, uh, directions. But today I want to focus on the work that we've been doing uh, on uh, actually construction materials and how searching at smaller and smaller scales actually allow us to uh, understand something interesting and not trivial which then we can bring up to uh, try to bring up in larger scales. Okay, so as I said, uh, this is a work that concerns uh, the fact the physics uh, and physical chemistry of building materials. And by building materials, uh, I mainly uh, mean uh, cement and concrete materials that we need to be uh, cohesive, strongly cohesive, because we want to be able to use them for uh, our infrastructure. We also need to be able to, you know, to uh, uh, sustain load and uh, resist uh, and resist to stresses and, in fact, uh, also um, um, keep their functioning and their performances over here and over changes in the environment uh, they are uh, they are used in. Uh, and so this uh, all this actually uh, provides a lot of constraints uh, and uh, uh, very um, uh, interesting interface between different effects which can happen in different landscapes. Uh, and 
so to to really understand uh, all these works uh, requires a uh, very strong effort, and there is a lot to a lot of work to do still uh, to complete this uh, this type of task and be able to design on a small scale. So from the really the chemistry of the material, the performances of the materials uh, over several uh, landscape decades uh, of landscapes uh, to then understand how what the way we design the material uh, determine the way the material is used uh, and uh, resist to changes in the environment or how its performances can evolve. So all these things uh, are for us the motivation to go back to very small scale and try to understand what's happening there and then uh, inform the larger scales uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so one of the motivations is of course the fact that uh, the main construction material that uh, uh, that we use is uh, is a cement for con and concrete, and the cement, uh, the way we make cement, uh, is actually responsible for uh, a huge amount of CO two because cement is made uh, uh, an integral part of cement production is burning calcium carbonates and other minerals at very high temperature, and only this process is responsible for a sizable amount of the whole man-made CO two, and uh, in the end, uh, this is what determines a lot the fact that uh, building materials and construction are, uh, are something like 11% uh, of uh, the global CO2 uh, emission. And so then uh, the idea is uh, uh, the, the, the motivation to think about uh, uh, questions such as uh, how does 3D cement work and if we want to modify the chemistry, what are the minimum properties of the material that we need to retain? And, uh, or how can we, in fact, make uh, current cement stronger so that we can, in fact, uh, use less of it? How can we make also cement more, more durable so that uh, in depending in the changing uh, uh, environmental conditions that we are experiencing uh, in many places on Earth, uh, so that uh, we can, in fact, uh, start not just uh, make uh, sustainable materials in terms of more sustainable chemistry, but also more sustainable materials in terms of the way we use them and uh, uh, being smarter actually about how we use them. So all of this uh, goes for me through the idea of uh, uh, how we understand really how the material works from the very small scale going up in, uh, in landscapes uh, and timescales. So one aspect that has been become, uh, I think, more and more, and more interesting uh, in the construction idea to in fact uh, uh, mix this with place and this is uh, something that goes back to very long times uh, so it is known and it's used in many different contexts already. Uh, the, the use of uh, clays and soil for construction uh, is uh, as old you know as old as we can uh, think about uh, building infrastructure uh, mm -hmm. and uh, but it also it provides a, a uh, if you into the future because clays are materials which are available uh, all over space and also on other planets uh, and uh, on, uh, in, in space in general. And so then uh, uh, the sustainability uh, of uh, being able to use local resources and uh, more sustainable resources in terms of their uh, the way they can be, uh, in, they can, uh, be mixed with cement on Earth uh, makes uh, this option of uh, clay cement mixture of just understanding how clay function uh, in uh, in a very uh, in a very interesting way. One uh, interesting way for me is the fact that uh, when we think about uh, development in 3D printing technology and additive manufacturing with construction materials, uh, in fact, again, uh, the possibility, uh, the use of uh, 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 different type of cement mixture, in particular cement clay mixture, uh, opens uh, it's it's uh, it's. Um, it's an option uh, which is uh, integral uh, in uh, the use of these technologies because now the rules within which and constraints within which the material needs to be used uh, on the construction sites uh, are uh, radically different. We need to be able to control the biology as we print in a very specific way. And this raised a number of questions which were, for which, uh, for example, uh, uh, the traditional cement based uh, are not necessarily optimal. But this new mixtures and in particular the flexibility, the ductility that is provided by using a, a cement clay mixture becomes, uh, in fact, a very interesting aspect. Okay, 
so what I want you to do in this talk is the ones that I have provided, uh, that I told you what I have in mind when I uh, designed these studies, uh, or when we have designed these studies uh, over the years of uh, any question about understanding how the material function. Now I want to go to the questions that we have asked. And uh, I have articulated what I want to tell you like in three parts. The first part is going to be about the question, where is the cohesion so I told, uh, I told you in the beginning that we need these materials to be actually cohesive, uh, uh, to be able to sustain stresses and to be able to be strong in the environment in which we want to use them. Uh, Vinayal strength is a very important part of the reason why we use uh, and why cement is being such a, an important uh, uh, part of our construction uh, industry and construction technologies. So I want to talk about that. Uh, and then I want to build on that understanding and that I hope I will be able to convey to uh, show you how we have tried to address the question. Once that I know something about the cohesion, uh, and the cohesion on a very small scale, which is at the origin of the larger scale cohesion, uh, what is uh, that I can understand more about how the microstructure of the material actually develops. And then uh, I will give you a glimpse into how we can then understand how the microstructure actually then determines uh, the properties like durability and resilience of the material in the end. Properties that, uh, that concern much larger scale use of the material. Okay, so let me start. At the very small scale, when I say I want to understand the cohesion at very small scale, well, I'm really talking very small scale. So when I mix uh, uh, um, cement, for example, uh, cement powder with water uh, in the beginning we saw these are calcium silicates, uh, uh, the main components of a cement clinker uh, that uh, basically immediately dissolved in water and uh, from the dissolution of the material that is in the grain, the grains there is a new material that precipitates and these are calcium silicate hydrates which precipitate as uh, nanoparticles uh, which then have very cohesive interaction and uh, this is the source actually of cement so what are these nanoparticles and why they are so cohesive? They are basically made of uh, uh, calcium silicate hydrates, which uh, then develop and develops this nanoparticle, the precipitate this nanoparticles, and the nanoparticle develops very high surface charges during cement migration. In the solution that surrounds the nanoparticles, uh, there is uh, there are uh, ions, uh, basically mainly ions of water, and, uh, and so then. Uh, the, the, the internal structure of the mind of the nanoparticles is complex itself uh, because it has this layered structure in which water actually is embedded. Uh, and uh, even uh, the, you know, the very small scale uh, sub nanometer structure of the material is itself very complex. So you will really have an idea of a multi scale complexity that is provided in this, that is given in this material that uh, is quite uh, uh, daunting. So let's try to understand. Uh, in the end, uh, when uh, one of the, as I said, the main, the, one of the most interesting properties here is that these nanoparticles become very cohesive, and this is the main source of cohesion in mechanical strength and cement. So why do they become cohesive? In a very uh, simple way, in a very basic way, uh, you, uh, you know, I can think that uh, uh, in the end, I have uh, the surface of the nanoparticles, uh, which are charged, uh, and I told you that the charges, the surface charge becomes larger and larger uh, during cement uh, aggregation. And uh, I have uh, actually, of course, uh, a, a, a range of uh, ions in the solutions that are around, but like this is uh, mainly uh, calcium uh, ions in the calcium silicate hydrate, which are, which are very ions, and uh, which get trapped in the, between the surfaces uh, of wave water. The surfaces are highly charged and then negatively charged. So the question is, why is this material uh, uh, cohesive and sticky to start with. And the reason why I want to ask this question is because this really concerns some fundamental understanding of how the material works. But it also, and this fundamental understanding, in fact, it has to inform if we want to change the chemistry of the material, how do we change it? So um, how do I change, for example, uh, the material in a way that, let's say, is not required to burn on this calcium carbonate to, to produce a binder? Uh, without uh, actually perturbing or by keeping mechanical strength, uh, sufficient mechanical strength. 
And so uh, what I'm what I'm going to tell you is a story about how do we this is the asking this question is meant is actually uh, uh, brought us to understand something more general about uh, how uh, charge systems work when there is a high confinement of water and iron. So we, we actually know how uh, charge surfaces work in solution in presence of other ions. And uh, there is a, a general theory of how to describe the interactions between surfaces that can be uh, equally charged, but then uh, they are interspersed with uh, water and uh, counter ions, uh, which can be uh, of uh, various valency, various, uh, various, so various valencies, and various valencies, and various types. And uh, the main theory that, in fact, we have to describe this, uh, which is a theory that uh, goes back to the uh, beginning of the last century, uh, and that has worked uh, and has been very powerful to understand that a lot of uh, uh, interactions between charged surfaces in the solution, uh, in all sorts of uh, contexts, uh, from uh, you know, soft materials to biological materials to uh, also construction materials in certain cases, it's uh, the DIP which basically treats the problem as uh, you know, having two charged surfaces and then considering uh, all the possible interactions between these two surfaces, also in presence of ions, considering other lots, a uh, lot of interaction, uh, attractive interactions between the surfaces, but then also considering uh, actually the, the fact that the ions and counter ions can be interspersed in the, uh, and, uh, and form layers close to the surfaces uh, and considering the net precautions that uh, that counterbalance the attraction that I was saying before, uh, but just considering the entropy of the ions treated as an ideal ions. So the conditions in which this theory operates, uh, which are mainly uh, relevant to materials with relatively low surface charges and particularly monovalent ions, uh, is actually uh, of limited applicability here. And in fact, it doesn't work for the condition of spot, where I have mainly uh, multivalent counter ions and I have uh, I significantly higher uh, surface charges. So we need to do something different to understand what's the origin of the equation here. And in fact, uh, so it has become clear that uh, uh, the main sources of the interactions in cement, they actually come from the, the effects that uh, the IPO theory neglects, which is the fact that I cannot treat the ions as a simple uh, as a simple uh, gas, uh, and therefore uh, consider their contribution to so their revulsion as, uh, uh, in fact, uh, just uh, related to the entropy of the, uh, of the ions in between, trapped in between the surfaces. But I really need to consider that there can be strong correlation effects between the ions uh, and, uh, in order to get attractive interactions in this case. So, previous studies they have shown that I can consider it, uh, explicitly the physics of the ions uh, and the fact that they can have correlations uh, in the way they are arranged in between the two surfaces. Uh, and uh, if I consider the water as a dielectric continuum, uh, then I can see that I can produce a, a uh, this is a work by actually uh, Roland and Landau from some years ago, where they uh, basically discussed how you can get, in fact, for the surface charge density that are typical of acetylic uh, uh, hydrogen of surface place and uh, uh, if I consider the confinements that I get in the system, in fact I can get, this is the amount of the pressure that I would get, uh, and the excess pressure that I would get between the two surfaces due to the presence of the ions, and so I can see that there is a range where I can get actually attractive forces contrary to what uh, the ideal theory would predict. So uh, if I do that, uh, I am happy, but I realize that the type of pressure, the type of cohesion that I would get uh, doing this type of studies, why it is in the right sign is actually doesn't justify the strength that I can actually obtain in cement and that is central to using the material for construction. So what we did uh, is actually to jump even to smaller scale and in fact to consider a semi-interesting approach where we have a, a surfaces that are charged, negatively charged, they are able to press the, the, the distances between them is something that we can control in the numerical simulations. And uh, we can actually include the ions, and when I'm also going to show you case class of ions, but of course I can change the type of ions, and I'm going to say something about that. And consider, uh, and the breakthrough here is really to consider uh, a molecular description of 
border, like for example, you know, in some of the simulations, most of the simulations, we use an SPC model for the water, but we also vary the model for the water to show that uh, you know, models that are good enough in reproducing molecular details of the water, in fact, they will uh, uh, provide you a very important new insight into how this works. So, the reason why we went from this semi atomistic approach is because uh, there isn't this, you know, I can use a fully atomistic description for the whole system, but then I am limited in the range of parameters that I can explore in terms of distances between the surfaces and the amount of water that I can put in, and especially something that I can do about the dynamics of this uh, combined system. And uh, because something, the dynamics of this system becomes a crucial and important factor in something uh, getting the metropic contribution to the interactions uh, and, uh, and getting uh, an adequate estimate of the final condition uh, between the two surfaces that can be relevant to get to go then to larger land scale. So in these studies what we realize is that when you start, so this is our simulation box where you can see some simple representation of the molecular water, the counter ions are just squeezed uh, as we increase this, the surface charge of the surfaces then uh, you, the cataracts get more and more squeezed towards the surfaces. But what is even more interesting is that when we can increase the confinement, and so we reduce the amount of water uh, in everything in between the two surfaces, then you start to see that actually water uh, is able to be organized uh, around the ions uh, and change the actual water ions in this very confined system in a very specific way. So basically you get uh, ion specific uh, um, water, um, uh, water structures which are reorganized around the ions and these ion water structures are very specific both of the degree of component that I ask and of the surface charges that I get. These uh, of these uh, structures that we identify the situation and then change significantly as you can see uh, in this plot here uh, where I'm looking at the fraction of uh, islands that have a certain amount of water molecules around them. So I can see how this population dramatically change when I go to these high confinement regions. And uh, I can identify specific structures that now I can see they're very uh, asymmetric and actually they I can compute their mechanical stability. So they are entropy the gain in internal energy gain in forming this structure but also they are entropic uh, gain or the entropic loss in forming so that they get proper access to their stability and to their resistance. And so when I do this, I realize that actually the attractive interaction that I can measure is a dramatically controlled by this. So the data that you hear and see here, this is the excess pressure between the two surfaces due to the confinement of the ion and water. And as I vary the distance between the two, the two surfaces in the simulations, and uh, the, this field spread that you get here are the attraction and comparison that I would get if I treated the water as bulk. So if I didn't get all this structural effect. But if I get the structural effect right, um, which basically, uh, as I told you before, it happens uh, even with different uh, modern models of the water, uh, as long as they are accurate enough, then what I obtain is that uh, basically the interactions now becomes huge and increases by two orders of magnitude. So this is not a small effect, what I'm talking about. I can then uh, try to prove even more that this is uh, an important and fundamental effect by devising a theory which we have done with our collaborators, in particular, Emmanuel Trezac uh, in Paris, that is a specialist of electrostatic and soft matter, and he designed a theory where basically we, they can compute the effective interaction now considering that uh, the baking blocks of the interactions are actually these uh, uh, dressed ions which are given by this uh, ion water structure that we see and they are different up under confinement and they depend on the surface charges actually uh, and they can see that now if they consider that these are the, the units uh, that in fact need to be, whose packing needs to be optimized and uh, uh, whose uh, uh, packing needs to optimize the electrostatic interactions in between the two surfaces, then I get this continuous line that uh, describes actually perfectly well what I can measure in the simulation. So we, through this, we have a proof that the, the source of the interaction, that we measure the interaction, is really due to 
this type of electrostatic effects. And in the end, it's very important, uh, uh, this picture, because we, looking into this, we realize that uh, uh, what is happening here is that as I increase my environment, the water that I get rid of is actually the water that is sort of free, the water that remains the water that is completely trapped and persistently trapped and uh, uh, optimized, uh, optimally uh, organized in this structure, uh, and which also means that there is no dielectric screening anymore that the water can provide, uh, and, uh, uh, and therefore the electrostatic uh, interactions explode, and I have this very, very strong pollution. Uh, and the results that we have here are completely consistent with the, the very recent understanding of the drop of the electrostatic ring screening that water can provide in very confined regimes. Uh, and it has some papers here where this has been studied. And basically, what we find and what we realize is that uh, the, the, the ions uh, that are interact between the water due to the charges of the surfaces, they are actually uh, as the enhancing this effect and making this, uh, uh, this electrostatics uh, even more dramatically important. And uh, this is uh, here you can see that uh, the theory that we had devised with MML and even actually is able also to predict the amount of water that is in our, in our simulation as we increase the amount of uh, refinement. Uh, and this is a calculation of the stability, this is just uh, the energy gain from a different type of structure, just to give you an example of the type of calculation that supports uh, the insight and, and, and inform the insights that we gain. So what another very interesting aspect that comes emerges now naturally is something that had been observed and had been known in the cement migration for a very long time that during cement migration there is in fact the appearance of a two different state population of water, of fine water and free water, of water and free water that we can clearly distinguish and naturally emerge in our simulation uh, thanks to the picture that I will and physics that I was just telling you about. So we can measure the dynamics of the Water, and we can measure the dynamics of the free water that you would actually measure in experiments like uh, uh, scattering uh, or quadrimetry or anything. Uh, and so then we understand where these characteristics of cement migration uh, emerges and how it, it plays actually, it's directly connected to the development of this very strong uh, cohesion. And we also understand how this dynamics of this so it can be different depending on the type of surface charges, for example, if we go from cement surfaces to uh, clay surfaces. It depends actually on the type of ions that we get, because remember this uh, ion water structure are uh, in fact, uh, you know, they depend on how you optimize the structures and the interactions of the water with the specific ions in the confinement. Conditions. What this means is that what is important is not just the valency of the ions naturally, but also the size of the ions. And so this makes that in fact when you change ions, which we have done in this simulation, and this uh, is the density profile of the ions in between the two surfaces, now you can see that again the primitive model is what you would get uh, without considering uh, the molecular nature of the water, so just when uh, in fact uh, Considering the water as a bulk electric, and now if you if you consider the molecular water, uh, it is the same way to the approach. I can see that uh, the, the the density profile of the ions uh, change dramatically, and they become again also ion specific uh, in a way that is uh, interesting and justifies the ion specific nature of these forces uh, uh, in a way that was known in practice but had been so far very hard. Uh, to predict. Uh, and uh, the plot that you have here is actually uh, to show you the dependence on the surface charges, which again is not captured uh, by uh, if you don't consider the molecular nature of the water, and instead it's captured by our approach. So we have now a tool to in fact understand how both valency and size matter. How, where, for example, of my certain type of effect in this class of material can emerge. And uh, in which condition uh, we can, uh, uh, in fact, uh, now think about modifying the chemistry of this uh, broad range of materials uh, 
uh, with the weight control but control still the type of uh, interactions that you will get on the, and that will affect the behavior of the material at larger landscapes. So let me show you an example of what we can do. So these are the calculations that we have done for uh, again for uh, the case you know surface charge densities and type of confinement that you will get in the calcium state the silicate hydrate during some integration. So what you realize is that the interactions in fact will change uh, over time and uh, you know, we can use as a proxy to find uh, the surface charge density. So as you increase the surface charge density you consider only calcium ions in simplified calculation but still you can get as I showed you before this huge increase in the in the attraction and you will get interesting but also a change in the type of profile of the forces which is reminiscent of the change that has been seen in this uh, I would say um, you know uh, studies uh, experimental studies of uh, uh, interactions between CSH surfaces during some integration by the group uh, of uh, Adrian. So the question uh, that we see is uh, change in this profile it's interesting to us because we want to understand okay let's say we know how to compute the cohesion and we can bring back the cohesion to the type of ions that we have that in concentration so also the surface charges and so on but uh, what does it mean that the interaction shapes change over time and so this means that we can take this profile this information of the profiles from these very small scale and synchronistic simulations and now bring them back to the properties of material and of material at larger scale where we not, not only know that the particles actually uh, stick together and they're very cohesive but they form in fact this multi-scale uh, aggregated gel structure which is amorphous on a larger scale and it has a very complex and interesting uh, sort of self-organization uh, and this self-organization on a larger scale uh, that we can quantitatively uh, investigate and it has been investigated uh, using for example neutral uh, scattering uh, in fact it tells us that there is a material which is very heterogeneous but also very dense uh, becomes very dense uh, at later stages of the integration and it's uh, the, the, the morphology of the structure that has to play a role uh, in the mechanics as well not just the interactions between the surfaces of the particles so what we have done is to devise now simulations where we can put in the, in, the, the information that we have from smaller scale uh, and the, the nanoscale collision that I was talking about in a scheme in which we can in fact uh, study how the interactions and the specific profile of the interaction at a given time during some integration can uh, build, can contribute, can determine the way the gel structure is made up. So in this simulation we combine basically a classical empty approach which on the basis of the interaction that we put in from the nanoparticles then uh, come get out the, uh, the type of application that we can get and involve the kinetic and the equilibrium effect that are embedded in it. We combine this with a sort of uh, multi value scheme where you, where you keep adding particles to mimic the presence of this chemical reaction. And the combination of these two schemes in fact allows us, it's interesting because it allows us to uh, study the situation in which in fact the, 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 the kinetics of the particle addition, so the reaction can, the kinetics is very slow, so everything is dominated by the dynamics and by the interactions with the particles, with uh, in fact, uh, and we can branch out to a rather opposite situation, the other limiting condition, where everything is controlled by the kinetics of the reaction and the particles do not have the time to interact, to, you know, to really explore if you want phase space and uh, to basically uh, get to the structures that, uh, that we will build. Uh, and so we've done this set of studies by considering different modern interactions which are uh, you know, uh, uh, a simplified version of what we've seen from the nanoscale collision and uh, basically they capture the fact, uh, simply capture the fact that as you go on in time you get a deeper, a deeper uh, attraction with a reduced uh, intermediate range so these are examples of uh, how what you will see in these simulations with two different types of interactions with a different interaction profile and similar reaction kinetics. So the left you will see this is interactions that are more typical of the early stage of cement integration, and this on the right would be more typical of the late stage of cement integration. 
So you can really see that even combined with the reaction kinetics uh, the, of the, the early stage of the interactions, they will tend to form a branching uh, a branch gel structure, which can provide some mechanical stability and some mechanical uh, response in very early stages. But then these uh, these uh, poor structures that comes out from the self assembly of this network progressively densify to give you a cis material that is denser and denser. In the, on the right, you see that the interactions, these type of interactions, will be less, you know, uh, capable of producing a more homogeneous structure. They will have a, a broader range of pore sizes. Uh, they will get to mechanical stability later, but then they will allow you to actually densify much more and for longer time and much longer times. And so we understand that what's happening actually in cement migration is uh, due to these changes of this uh, uh, nanoscale cohesion and of the cohesion profile, it's actually important for the way the structure of the material itself assembled, which then creates a unique uh, footprint, actual imprint of how the material, uh, sorry, I wanted to say fingerprint, not footprint, a unique fingerprint of uh, how the material the structure uh, gets formed through the evolution of the interactions, which also is important to understand which type of stresses actually get embedded in this type of uh, uh, larger scale structure has the interaction changed from something that would prefer to build a, like a uh, branch uh, percolating structure to something that instead favor uh, low density and uh, uh, um, stronger uh, attraction uh, and therefore uh, stronger resist the resistance under uh, tension. So uh, this is to try to introduce the idea that in fact the mechanics <coughs> of how this structure formed then we determine uh, not necessarily the cohesion of the material but we determine how then the material will behave on a larger, uh, on larger time scale and and larger length scale, and which are especially relevant uh, for uh, the, 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 the interaction of the material in the environment. Because in the end, the type of size, for example, of course, size distribution that I get, it will be the result of this complex, non equilibrium process. And the type of pore size that I get will be central in the way the material can absorb, uh, uh, for example, like, and manage humidity in the environment how the material also can uh, function, you know, when, uh, in terms of uh, insulation properties. And uh, also, what is the type of plastic processes that, that material, how that kind of material can be at much larger landscapes. So in this type of simulation, we can also try to understand how, in fact, the, the, the heterogeneities in the, all the reaction processes that occur in this type of in the, in, in the, Hydration environment can uh, can change the type of microstructure. For example, here it is similar type of simulation that I showed you so far, but then we're done by in fact considering the particles precipitate uh, uh, mainly because there is a dissolution from the surface. There is a dissolution from from the surface of the grains, so there is a precipitation gradient that actually changes as you go away from the surface of the grains that we have placed on the. the two surfaces in this direction in our simulation box. And so you can see that the different interactions are always the same interactions here on the left that I was showing you before that correspond to the early stages of the integration to the interaction correspond to the later stages of the integration. So the gradient in the density in fact will change uh, will be the fact of the gradient in the density will be different depending on the different uh, interactions. And, uh, uh, and finally you can get okay, the finally densified materials what is the type of pore structure that I get? And here it's a, a very um, important study something that we did some time ago also with Enrico, where in fact uh, we were comparing the type of scattering that we would obtain in this uh, model uh, simulation structure that you see in the end, in, on the right here, which have been uh, uh, colored uh, in terms of the local density. This is uh, work made up by Katerina Ioannito. And, uh, and on the left, you can see that there is a core network that is uh, embedded in this type of complex microstructure. So the scattering uh, is basically, uh, in fact, capturing the bulk of this feature, the size of the pores and the local density variation. And you obtain a scattering profile here, which you can 
directly to the MMP experiments. And so this tells you that with this type of modeling, we do capture some essential aspect of the way the disordered structure of the material, which is strongly correlated with this disorder and very uh, uh, you know, hierarchical and hit during this complex self assembly behavior, is well captured by the model that we have uh, that we have built up by connecting the smaller scale uh, characteristics across different landscapes. And so finally, can uh, you uh, now take these samples uh, and these modern uh, uh, materials uh, that have shared very interesting and unique fundamental characteristics with the real material and perform mechanical tests uh, in the simulations, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, and this is also some capacity that the people has built over the years. And, uh, and so basically you can uh, now in the simulation with this type of modeling approach, you can do interesting things because this is our initial sample. You realize that there is a change in the local density. You have a back loop that in fact uh, is uh, densified and densified uh, across the different stacks of this hierarchical self assembly. This back one is strongly under compression. And, uh, uh, and in fact, uh, it's uh, the toughest part of the material. That is mainly what is measured in the number of condition experiments. And we can identify this by comparing our number of uh, models that computed in the simulation with the number of condition experiments of our colleagues at MIT. And, uh, and so you can see that uh, most of the number of condition models measured in the experiments, it actually comes from this very dense uh, uh, compressed backbone, uh, but in fact uh, the, the layer of progressively less density and uh, they are progressively more and more under tension of materials which are self-assembled uh, at these uh, various steps, they are going to be more important uh, for uh, the development of plastic properties, plastic processes that can uh, uh, determine, for example, the density of the material, the, the, the fracture of Therefore, play a very important role in, uh, the, uh, in uh, the, the understanding the behavior of the material at much larger landscapes. So, I want to conclude and to summarize what I have told you. Uh, I, I hope I have convinced you or give you a glimpse of how, in fact, uh, you know, starting to look in the material at smaller scale, it's actually important to, to understand what is the origin. Of, uh, of the cohesion, in this case of materials like cement and clay, it's really an unavoidable step. And I need to, you know, uh, to look and in fact I really need for these complex materials to look at all the way down to the molecular complexity of water in order to understand how this cohesion uh, in fact works. Uh, once that I make that effort, now there is a whole new path that opens up to me because I have the physical chemistry of these materials can in fact control the, uh, their cohesion. And uh, this is the key to understand uh, what are the modifications that are actually possible and impossible uh, if I want to keep uh, a certain uh, cohesion and if I want to control the cohesion as well. Uh, I get some fundamental insight, I think, into some fundamental points that uh, in fact uh, uh, the I understand why this non-scale cohesion is highly specific. And this comes from the fundamental physical understanding of how the cohesion works at this very small scale. That water is central in it, but at the same time, I would need a very small amount of water uh, to actually uh, uh, do the job. Uh, and, uh, uh, and these are fundamental concepts that are very important if I want to consider using uh, I want to say, or design scientifically, the use of clay-based binders, uh, binders uh, uh, alone, or with the cement to change, in fact, the way we use and we make construction materials. I then the fact that I understand not just the amount of cohesion, but also the profile of the cohesive forces, it changes the way I understand the kinetics of self-assembly mm -hmm. of the structure from this cohesive interaction between the nanoparticles, particles And uh, this, uh, I can see how, in fact, the complex processes that can hierarchically build the gel 
performance factor determines things like poor network and stress evolution. And these are central, important factors to understand the behavior of the material in the external environment and in the infrastructure. For us, the main motivation ahead is then bringing back this understanding into really designing the neurology of these spaces and uh, uh, understanding the implication for the liberty. And uh, I'm happy to discuss more of this point if you have questions about that. I want to uh, just conclude mentioning that in fact, uh, all these uh, thoughts and this knowledge and this insight, in fact, have led us also to think more deeply how, uh, in fact, we can start a whole new way uh, of, uh, of making material and using material where you can try to design uh, not just material strength but uh, all material composition but really you can have the ambition to design durability and resilience of building and infrastructure through the design of the material itself. But if you want to do this, you really need to go through all this. There is no uh, free lunch here. Uh, and finally, I want to uh, just uh, uh, mention that this, uh, working in this area and uh, thinking more about these problems uh, has actually helped us uh, understand that there is a, 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 a connection that we can make between the type of understanding of the material that we build and the type of uh, action that uh, uh, can be taken also from the policy needs to be taken, also from the policy side when we think about how the material is used and what are the constraints from uh, uh, you know, the regulation uh, the, that, I, that are governing the way the material is used uh, in society for construction. And that's why we have started to build a link between our research and science, the research of colleagues here at Georgetown in uh, uh, science policy for green technologies to try to maybe to start a communication, more than communication between science and engineering and that uh, and the, science, the policy. So with this, I want to really conclude. I think I said everything that I wanted to say. I want to thank my collaborators, especially um, you know the, the students and postdocs and colleagues here uh, at Georgetown and at NIST, with whom I worked a lot during the, the last couple of years, and the collaborators uh, from uh, uh, the early work, especially uh, Katerina and uh, uh, even. And uh, people uh, in Europe, but uh, I also want to thank especially Nico. We started to uh, uh, work together with this uh, uh, some years ago, and uh, and it's nice to uh, to know about each other's work and follow each other after uh, some years. And I want to thank you for.